Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be exploring a relatively new kind of stem cell that was created a little over 10 years ago back in 2006. And this stem cell is called an induced pluripotent stem cell, or iPSC. Uh, this is an extremely important area of research right now, um, figuring out the applications for this, and also the creation of this by a Japanese group, which we'll look at in a little bit, actually won a Nobel Prize. So this is an extremely important finding for science. Now, understand that the work that went into creating these induced pluripotent stem cells was enormous in magnitude, and nothing should be taken away from that. However, when we actually look at how they did it on paper, look at a little diagram, it's actually going to look pretty simple. It's one of those things where in hindsight, before you knew how to do it, it was really complicated. But then once you put it on paper, it's actually, wow, that was that simple? Really? And so when we look at its diagram, uh, how they actually accomplished this, it's fairly simple. The applications are fairly simple to understand. So rather than jumping straight into that, I'd actually want to go over a little bit of the history of how these induced pluripotent stem cells came to be and also the science behind that. All right, so to start, uh, a lot of you probably recognize this actor right here. This is the late actor Christopher Reeve, who's mostly known in movies for portraying Superman on the big screen. Now, something very unfortunate happened to Christopher Reeve, and this happened when he was fairly young. So he was an avid horseback rider, and he did horse shows. Now, I'm by no means any expert on horse shows, but I think we all know from watching movies and so forth that when you do the horse shows, you ride the horse, do things like jumping over ledges. You can probably tell I'm extremely ignorant on the topic. But there's an old saying in any sport, and it's that you never do something in competition that you haven't practiced beforehand. So Christopher Reeve is at the horse show, but for whatever reason, he's not able to ride his normal horse. So he has a different horse that he's never used before. Now, he should have known better than this, but he tried to do something that that horse may have not been used to. And long story short, he was catapulted off the horse, and he landed in such a way that it severed his spinal cord. And it severed his spinal cord pretty much uh, close to the neck region. And you probably can guess that when that happens, not only do you lose all your functions in your legs, but also your arms as well. And so unfortunately, this accident made him a quadriplegic. And so this is actually Christopher Reeve shortly before his passing. And Christopher Reeve is remembered mainly for two things. One, of course, is his portrayal as Superman. But the other thing is his advocacy for the research on embryonic stem cells, because in the end, before he died, his dreams were to be able to walk again and to be able to hug his family. And so the only way that, they, that he thought he would be able to do that is if they were able to get enough research on embryonic stem cells in order to regenerate those parts of his spinal cord that were damaged. And so theoretically, if he were able to heal those things, he'd be able to walk again and hug his family with his own arms. Okay. Now, this did not happen, and part of the reason for that is that even to this day, there's a lot of ethical dilemmas that have been faced when it comes to doing research on embryonic stem cells. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into much of that right here, all the, the ethical things. But before we go any further with that, we need to understand what are embryonic stem cells. And to understand that, we need to know what an embryo is. So an embryo, and of course we're talking about humans, is a very early stage in human development. In fact, it's the first stage. And it really begins with the zygote. Now, the zygote is the product of fertilization of the secondary oocyte, and then we get the ovum, and then finally those pronuclei fuse, and we get the zygote. So the zygote is the very first cell in all human development. And from the zygote, we get every other cell that you have in your body. Okay. Now with the zygote, here's another picture right here, we got the zygote. The zygote is going to divide through a process called cleavage. Okay, so we can see here the zygote, it's a fairly large cell. It's going to divide by cleavage. Mitosis is different than cleavage. Okay, mitosis is a process where the cell divides and you get two identical daughter cells. Now think about if the zygote under, underwent true mitosis, where it had two identical daughter cells. Well, you'd have to have two cells that look just like this. They'd also be the same size. So in order for the zygote to undergo mitosis, 
true cell division, it would have to first grow, basically double in size, and then it would split, and then it would get two identical daughter cells. Well, the question is, are these two right here in the two cell stage, are these identical daughter cells? And the answer is no. They're not identical because they're half the size. Okay, so in mitosis, you have growth of the cell that's dividing first, and then it divides to give two identical daughter cells. This process where the zygote is dividing, it does not involve growth during interphase. The only thing that is incorporated during interphase is, is the replication of DNA. And so when this cell splits, it doesn't grow. It undergoes cleavage. Okay. So it still divides, there's still replication of DNA, but there's no growth. And so each of these resulting cells is about half the size as the original zygote. So that's cleavage. We go from a zygote into a two-cell stage. Both of these cells will undergo cleavage, and so then you'll have a four-cell stage, and then from the four-cell stage you'll get eight cells, and then 16, and 32, and so on and so forth. And that's a really simplistic way of looking at it, but that's basically what happens. Eventually, you're going to form a cell called a morula, and then the morula will continue dividing further, and then you'll get a cell called a blastocyst. And this is extremely important. Once you get to the blastocyst level, uh, you start seeing these cells differentiate. Okay? And so inside the walls of the blastocyst, there's two main areas. We have first what's called the epiblast. This is a little bit larger. The epiblast will eventually, in development, differentiate into cells of the mesoderm and cells of the ectoderm. Right here in green, we have the primitive endoderm, which you could guess becomes the endoderm. And so we'd have the endoderm cells, we would have the ectoderm cells, and the mesoderm cells. Okay. But the point is, these cells of the blastocyst, which is still technically in the embryonic stage, these cells could potentially be harvested. Okay. These are embryonic stem cells, or ESCs, and then those embryonic stem cells could uh, be converted into virtually any cell type. Okay. You'd first have to get them into the right lineage, whether it be endoderm, ectoderm or mesoderm, but you could have heart cells generated, you could have liver cells, you could have neurons, okay? The possibilities are endless. And so the gist of the ethical dilemma with embryonic stem cells is you, of course, have to have a blastocyst, which is a developing embryo, and you can just guess on what the uh, implications of that would be. Now, assuming that we're after the embryonic stem cells, the question would be, why would we prefer embryonic stem cells to the zygote, or even the two-cell, four-cell, or eight-cell stage, all of which are totipotent. And the reason is because the totipotent cells actually have an extreme disadvantage. And that disadvantage is the fact that they're not self-renewing. Remember what I mentioned a couple slides ago. Remember that these cells, which are all totipotent, do not undergo true mitosis. They only undergo cleavage. You might have been wondering why I even mentioned that. This is the reason. It's because if the cell doesn't undergo true mitosis, you can't really grow it, right? It can't self-renew. So totipotent stem cells have that disadvantage, okay? They only undergo cleavage, and that's a problem if you're trying to make a lot of these cells from just a few, if you're trying to grow them, in other words, okay? So we wouldn't actually want a totipotent stem cell. That's actually not gonna serve us as well. What we re really want is a pluripotent stem cell. So we have to isolate these embryonic stem cells from the blastocyst, which very shortly after is going to implant in the uterine wall and will eventually become the fetus, so to speak. So now I'm gonna make a point that's gonna lead us into the induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs, okay? Now, clearly to get the embryonic stem cells, we'd have to isolate them from the blastocyst, but let's assume that there's lack of funding, there's problems getting uh, research dollars to do that, we can't get embryonic stem cells. So wouldn't it be nice if we could get a cell type that's basically an embryonic stem cell, it's identical practically, but we don't have to get it from a blastocyst. 20 years ago that might have been science fiction, but let's look at this diagram right here and see if we can reason a way to get these cells but not from a blastocyst. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. So we isolate these embryonic stem cells from a blastocyst. We can then differentiate them into multipotent cells. 
So whether it is an endoderm cell, an ectoderm cell, or a mesoderm cell, and then those cells respectively can become specific cell types. For example, an ectoderm cell could be differentiated into a neuron, or we could have a mesoderm cell di differentiate into a muscle cell. Now prior to 2006, all the textbooks read that this process of going from these pluripotent stem cells only went one direction toward terminally differentiated cells. It just went one direction. So some people got together and said, well, wouldn't it be interesting and useful, actually, if we could take a terminally differentiated cell, which we call a nullipotent cell, and convert it back into a pluripotent stem cell? Because then if we could do that, we would bypass the need of having to get those stem cells from a blastocyst. And that's exactly what they did. And this work was done by a Japanese group, Kazutoshi Takahashi and Shinya Yamanaka, and the paper is titled Pluripotent Stem Cells for Mouse Embryonic and Adult Fibroblast Cultures by Defined Factors. And this paper and work won these people a Nobel Prize. So here's the gist of what they did. Okay? They took adult human fibroblasts, so here's fibroblasts from a patient, and these fibroblasts, mind you, are terminally differentiated cells they don't naturally go backwards in this hierarchy to form a multipotent cell. Okay? The fibroblasts are terminally differentiated nullipotent cells. But it turns out that what this group found out that you could do through a lot of painstaking work, and I highly recommend that you read the paper, um, I'll actually provide a link to it in cell in the description, they found out that you could actually add a few transcription factors, four to be precise, and reprogram that fibroblast. In other words, what they did is they added four specific transcription factors. And these transcription factors were OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYK. And it turns out that when you add these four transcription factors to a culture of fibroblast, they actually cause the fibroblast to revert backwards in hierarchy and you form pluripotent stem cells that for all intents and purposes are virtually identical to the embryonic stem cells that you would isolate from the blastocyst. Okay? That is extremely powerful because then what you can do is you can grow the resulting iPSCs, the pluripotent stem cells. Why can you grow them? Because pluripotent stem cells are self-renewing. They're not totipotent cells, which are like the zygote two-cell stage, four-cell, and eight-cell. Okay? Those do not self-renew because they undergo cleavage. Pluripotent stem cells, like the ones isolated from the blastocyst, they undergo true mitosis, so you can grow these things. And then you can induce them to form specific cell types. For example, if you want to do neural induction, you add specific transcription factors that would convert a stem cell like this into a neuron or glial cells. And so the possibilities really seem to be endless. For example, in this diagram, you take some induced pluripotent stem cells, add some transcription factors that get you neural and glial precursor cells, and then add other transcription factors to, in one case, induce these to differentiate into oligodendrocytes, induce these to di differentiate into true neurons, and then these to differentiate into astrocytes. So you can imagine, you could take these induced pluripotent stem cells and form virtually any kind of cell imaginable. And here's another application of this. Okay? So you can take from the patient, you can take fibroblasts, and this has also been shown to be able to be done with hair keratinocytes. And you can reprogram these cells by adding those four specific transcription factors. And then they convert backwards into induced pluripotent stem cells. In this example, they're taking those pluripotent stem cells and adding some transcription factors, which are not mentioned. But the point is they cause these to differentiate into cardiomyocyte-like cells. And then potentially what you could do is you could take these, test them for beating, because that's what heart cells do, and then transplant them back into the patient. So if the patient suffered a heart attack, a myocardial infarction where that heart tissue is damaged and it is replaced with scar tissue, you have a situation where the person has a reduced cardiac efficiency, which leads to problems. However, if you could take these cardiomyocytes and transplant them back into the patient, you could reverse the effects of having a severe heart attack, which is extremely powerful.
But there's one other thing that's extremely powerful about this research on induced pluripotent stem cells, and I want you to think about it. You're taking fibroblasts, or whatever cell type it is, from the patient. Okay? Think about what happens if you took just a general neuron and tried to transplant it into a patient. You might have tissue rejection. Because on every human cell type, except for a couple, like red blood cells and platelets, there are proteins called MHC proteins. And these MHC proteins are specific to a particular person. So I have a certain MHC protein, you have a certain MHC protein, and they're not compatible with one another. Your MHC proteins are only compatible within yourself. You can't just take my tissues and transplant them into you. Okay? It doesn't work like that. You'd have tissue rejection. The nice thing about this is if you take these fibroblasts from the patient, they bear the patient's own MHC proteins. So after you culture these up, once you've actually induced them into pluripotent stem cells, once you culture them up and grow them, these oligodendrocytes or these neurons or these astrocytes or here cardiomyocytes, they would bear the patient's own MHC protein. And that's really cool because you bypass the immune system. Because even though you pulled these cells out and transformed them, the MHC proteins would be conserved. And so when you transplant them back into the patient, the immune system will recognize them as their own self cells. So this was a really cool discovery by this Japanese group, and you can probably guess that it has a lot of active areas of ongoing research. But I hope that I made this make sense and give you a little bit of the backstory and science behind what led to this discovery. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.